Hello and uh, welcome back to San Diego's Dead Wasp Cast. My name's Matt Dolby. Uh, two weeks ago in the last episode, we ended the discussion at the point where we were talking about issues of immigration. We were talking about things arising from Brexit and the Tory party conference, which had, were very recent uh, events at the time of the recording. Uh, and the discussion picks up from there. There's a little overlap with... Uh, the last program just to help contextualise things, and it, then it uh, then it carries on from there. Uh, the people discussing matters are myself, Matt Dolby, um, Adrian Slatcher, whose voice I think will be the first that you'll hear, uh, Richard Barrett, and our anonymous guest who preferred not to be identified by name. So, uh, yeah, enjoy. But most of these illegal workers have probably been there quite a long time. Mm. Very few of them are from Europe. Many of them are from Brazil or anywhere else in the world. And clearly, um, the existing rules or laws, um, you know, um, that it, it, employers clearly are not doing the checking or are, um, uh, you know, and but the reason the employers colluded with it, I can't remember which chain it was, but the, the reason they colluded with it was to stop getting a big fine. Yeah. And now you sit there going, well, actually, regardless of the, the wrongs and rights of this, it seems that the, the workers who are, yeah, may, may, may be here illegally in some way, shape or form, but are working hard, are getting the brunt of this, whereas the employers who are enabling them and making profit out of it aren't. Seems very unjust, doesn't it? Well, you, you, you know, it just seems to be, um, you know, we have, yeah, we have a situation where um, you know, th- th- in any country, you get a kind of uh, um, black market or a, a legal workforce, etc., mm-hmm. and that becomes very exploitable, and that for me seems the real problem, really. Yeah. 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 Do we do we still have whatever it was called, gangmasters? Yeah, gangmaster law. Yeah, because yeah. that kind of started out with HSE because it, it came in particularly after the. The, the Morecambe cockle pickers drowned, yeah. and, and got and then got spun off from there. But it seems that you now essentially you've kind of got in this case branches of government sort of at odds because this this kind of new idea is is obviously going to push people whose status is is unclear or is illegal further into the hands of, of gangmasters and people with very little scruples about the conditions that people are working in. Well, well also, this becomes the, the way, isn't it? If there is not a legal route, uh, there becomes... People go down... For the, money. The illegal route. I, I wrote a story um, a couple of years ago which got published in the Black magazine, this sort of, sort of Czech avant-garde magazine, and it was about, essentially, an illegal immigrant who was working, and he was in a kind of uh, rooming house, you know, so... Cash in hand, so nobody really bothers about papers. Um, and then um, he would go to a pickup point every morning, and he'd be driven in a van with a load of other people to a paint factory in the suburbs where he, he did. And you know, I'm not an expert on these things, so I've just picked up these uh, things. But I was quite interested, you know, in what the dynamics of this illegal economy are. How does mm-hmm. it work? Because it's. It's not working. We're not talking here about the um, the the au pair for the middle class family, you know, just one person. What we're talking about here is probably multinational companies or uh, supply chains to multinational companies. Actually, quite happy to have the exploitation uh, further down the supply chain, working with agency workers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. And so I'm quite I'm always quite interested in how that dynamic kind of works, really. Um, and, of course, the chief exec could always say, well, I didn't... And they probably won't know about yeah. it. No. Yeah. Except they do know that they're, they're trying to um, drive down costs. Like when my dad yeah, yeah. worked for a chain manufacturing company in the Midlands in the, in the 70s and 80s, he knew who he was selling his chain to. He knew who was working for him. He knew who his subcontractors were. Um, he, he, he probably knew where that chain would be. Uh, I spent most of my youth 
go around parks and my dad would be checking um, mm. um, sort of uh, uh, slides <laughs> and uh, 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 swings, you know, yeah. saying, oh, that's, that's not our chain. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> that, see. That, that'll break. <laughs> oh, right. like, like chains, yeah, like yeah, metal yeah. chains. But, like, it, was, yeah. it was light industrial, so it wasn't oh, the things right. you put around your neck and it wasn't the big ones that more ships, it was in the middle. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's that's a, a long problem, isn't it? Like just l- losing, l- like the the link between what we do. Link, very good. Yeah, yeah I heard yeah. that. And and the consequences or the effects or what happens next to the bit that we've done, like the supply it, chain. It's just, just, just. <laughs> The, at- the atomization, so we can only see our little bit, what we do, and we lose a sense of how our little bit connects with the next little bit. Because it's far too complex. Yeah, yeah. Everything be- is far too yeah, big and yeah. complex. So it's impossible for anyone to have the whole picture. Um, but in Adrian's dad's day... Yeah. So it reminds me of this of the... Um, one of my favourite anecdotes was um, when Poland um, joined the EU, and I think this is quite an interesting anecdote in terms of um, how international trade works, and when we leave, we'll, we will have this problem reversed. <laughs> um, we had the... the um, the great large shortage <laughs> because when when poland joined the eu um it was part of the single market yeah. so suddenly it didn't have to pay a premium on any goods that it imported from the rest of europe okay um poland uses more lard than other parts oh, of lard. europe large yeah what did you think? large <laughs> large 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 <laughs> large, <laughs> large shortage and the, and the main reason they do is because every autumn or every for Christmas, it's traditional in Poland to start doing lots of pies, lots of prep, uh, yeah, processed uh, products, if you like. Yeah. And uh, so for that, you use lard, right? Yeah. And suddenly they could get lard from anywhere in Europe, they could get a lot cheaper than probably previously, and there was an excess of lard elsewhere in Europe, which you no longer had to pay a premium on. And so, oh, my God. I, and so, I, I, you, you, no, obviously we don't use lard that much in Britain anymore, but for some Speak reason... Speak for yourself. It's a staple of our diet. <laughs> we don't have lard. We so, don't even have butter. So, so there I was in Sainsbury's, and I, I was... I, I, some recipe that I was... This needs lard, you know. This really does need lard. It was, you know. So there I was, uh, empty shelves. I was like, this is ridiculous. Kept going back in. No lard on the shelves of Sainsbury's. <laughs> and this was the European lard shortage of yeah. 2003. Well, so because <laughs> Poland, because <laughs> Poland had joined the EU. Fa- fa- thankfully, like, we've not had the great European hummus shortage. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you can well imagine. Mediterranean. But I think what I, what, I, what I thought was quite interesting about that is, in a very clear way, it kind of shows how um, free trade works in a, in yeah, a free yeah, trade zone. Yeah, yeah. Because basically, um, it means that you can't easily move uh, goods and you don't have to go for any rigmarole to do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned the hummus <laughs> shortage. <laughs> this, this CD from. Uh, uh, Chocolate Monk teleporters. Songs about Scepter Dial is great. All right, and they they have a song on it, uh, which I think might be called Chickpea Famine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a prophet. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. It, uh, well, no, it doesn't say. It's, we're, we're, but it's, it's got this lyric. We're, we're yards from Chaucer Chor- here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's with the great Quinone. But it's, it's, it's got this quinoa. The chickpea quinoa. famine. <laughs> the chickpea famine of '73. The price of hummus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, '73. Now chickpea. Uh, chickpea famine of '74. We're all doomed. We're all doomed. The price of almost went through the roof. <laughs> so I've got a question for you all. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've got quite a few tins in my cupboard, whereas my sister never does. So come, come, come the end of days, when we all have to go to the hills, my sister's doomed, isn't she? <laughs> but I, I'm OK for a while. But, but what, 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 would you, what would you collect or store? You know? what, what, Water. Or, you know, what, what, do, or what do you collect or store in terms of food? That you, you know, if you're going through your cupboards now, you think, hmm, I've got far too much Branston pickle or something <laughs> like that. Um, well, it's going to be the products I've just mentioned that we've just been talking about. <laughs> we have it on a daily basis. A, a product that um, uh, my familiarity with 
Uh, I've only been introduced to really in the past 18 months. Prior to 18 months ago, I've never had a performance in my life. <laughs> Um, oh, what happy days they were. <laughs> now, now I'm drowning in hummus. Is <laughs> Is there anyone who'd like to uh, give some background on why I'm now drowning in hummus? <laughs> Not me. Okay. <laughs> you, uh, Matt. Making the hummus yourself, are you buying it? Or? Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting two for two pounds. <laughs> I tried to make some hummus once and you just basically, it's just chickpeas and you put them in a blender with some lemon juice and stuff like that. But I hadn't put the blender on properly. So when I turned it on, there was just chickpeas all over the whole kitchen. And I've never attempted it since. My greatest cookery experiment was once when someone gave me a recipe for yoghurt and I attempted to make yoghurt myself. Now, I can't remember the details of it, other than it involved getting a pot of live yoghurt from a supermarket, <laughs> um, spooning that pot of live yoghurt into a bowl, adding like boiled milk and blah, 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 and then leaving it overnight wrapped in a coat. Um, so that's indeed, that's indeed what I did. And the next morning, I had shitloads of yoghurt, which was quite nice. Um, but I, I ended up throwing most of it away, sadly, because I made too much. <laughs> so that, that, that's an anecdote which has gone nowhere. <laughs> you, could have, you could have imported it to China. When I, was, when I was there doing my residency, it was quite big. They seem to have essentially two preferred breakfasts, porridge or yoghurt. <laughs> and yoghurt was also kind of used as a snack through the day. So, yeah. It's yeah, quite they, low they fat, were, usually, isn't it? If you're, uh, yeah, they would have been hot for your yoghurt. They would <laughs> have been all over that shit. I'm, I'm handing my notes in at work on Monday, and your career direction awaits me. <laughs> <laughs> and it involves live yoghurt and coats. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Mike, you mentioned your residency uh, there. Uh, like, what, what you're working on at the moment, or whatever? Yeah. At the moment, it's just bits and pieces. Um, I've got lots of ideas that are kind of stillborn. <laughs> there's, there's sort of things... Uh, I mean, I've got this, this empty frame, in which the idea is to put that in water and kind of film what's within oh, that wow. frame, which I might get around to. It just needs... Like, I need a big bag to carry it around, or I need to make a small frame. Oh, that's a really good idea. Um, yeah. I've got this mask, which I'm probably going to use for performance, which I'm in the process of making. Yeah, for for people watching this in black and white, yeah. uh, Matt has uh, just uh, brought a paper mache mask? No, no, it's, it? it's wire. Uh, this is uh, mod rock, so just plaster... Yeah, this looks like a future a future career plastic. kind of designing um, uh, kind of um, enemies for the doctor. Um, yeah, I want to could come come. I want to make this look a bit more melted, but Ooh. wow, yeah, that can be used for performance and Scary. I'll do a back piece on it and do some more with that. I watched. I mean that. that Connects to a film I uh, stayed up late last night watching DVD. I don't know if anyone else has seen it. Um, Eyes without a face. Oh yeah, the uh, Franju. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, fantastic film. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sure like of the place of the film in kind of cinema history. I'm not sure where what what place Franju occupies in the kind of uh, um, like director's pantheon or whatever but this film it, it was pretty awesome um, about this this doctor who it, it, him, him his wife and his daughter had been involved in a car crash and his his daughter had been like really seriously disfigured um, like very very badly and the doctor a uh, 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 dad the doctor was trying to like do a face transplant on her, which involved murdering loads of people Ooh. and try, trying to transplant their face um, f f on, onto his daughter. But in between times, like the daughter was like wandering around in this really blank mask. Uh, it seemed so Japanese no stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was really 
kind of impactful uh, just the scenes where she were like appearing around corners and things in in, mm. in this mask <laughs> well, I, I once as a, as a Halloween thing with friends uh, was, was did a, a kind of double bill of, of, of films to watch and chose that and uh, The Wicker Man oh, yeah. oh and, that's terrifying and, and The Wicker Man was kind of a bust because a lot of us found it Frightening. Oh, really? It's it is it is creepy. It's a good film, but it can be kind of funny as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas Eyes Without a Face was genuinely creepy. Yeah. As fuck. yeah. Even though it's it's thirties, maybe a bit later. It's um, around then. I'm not too yeah. sure of the period myself. It's, uh, you're like, this is like four years older than this other film, and it's mm. terrifying. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm interested in film. I'm not sure, like, if if, if we write with the date thirties, then was it? Will it have been an influence on the French New Wave? Um, do we? Does anyone know? I don't know. Um, and what did Franchi do besides that? Is it a kind of? Is, was he in effect a one-hit wonder, or has he done other notable I, films? I really don't know. Yes. Yeah, Stuff to stuff to make a look I up have, there. Actually. I have some kind of half ideas, but they might be wrong. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I really, yeah. really don't know. Um, you, you find you you, you actually. You, I know you watch a lot of films, but you find you sort of do read a bit of film history, or do you just turn to watch the films? Because I I I feel that with films, um, I sort of came of age in films in the eighties, really. Yeah, and there was kind of. I suppose a second American New Wave, really, in the early eighties. Where you're talking David Lynch and yeah. Cronenberg and people like that, and um, as well as a lot of European films at the same time. Um, and so, in many ways, I never really went back to um, those sort of films that the the, the, the the kind of film critics always go on about. Uh, so I've got big gaps, you know. Uh, I went back, I think, to the the precursor of that in the sense of the American New Wave of the late sixties, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, in terms of like classic films beyond that, I've always found I've I've, I've got pretty much a, a a bit of a gap, you know. So when people say, "Oh yeah, Woody Allen is very Bergman esque," I'm like, <laughs> "What does that mean?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, I, yeah. Of course, I don't say that. I just nod and go, "Yeah." yeah. <laughs> Woody Allen is very Bergman esque. <laughs> that's his most Bergman esque film. Does he mean does he mean Ingrid Bergman? I, that's what I thought for many years. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, no, that's that's probably not right. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean lots of slapstick, you know, <laughs> trousers falling down, pies to the face. Yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of shit. That's Marx, isn't it? <laughs> no, that was Engels. <laughs> <laughs> I set you up for that. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, I've been reading um, a, a fair bit of stuff as well uh, about, about films this year. A lot of it has come from uh, my mate at work who just sort of parachuted into my life with his carrier bags full of DVDs and books. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've been reading a fair bit. He, he, he seems to have a massive collection. I've never been around his house, but... Uh, he seems to basically have every DV, every every DVD that I could possibly want yeah. to watch, <laughs> and copies of like academic cinema journals from the seventies, which he, he 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 doesn't hesitate to lend me. So, um, I, and a brilliant book actually, uh, a specific book he lent me. Uh, Matt, f- a few months ago, we saw. Um, Laura Mulvey's The Riddles of the Sphinx. You've got it there. Yeah. Um, what well, her husband, Peter Wallen, um, wrote a book called Signs and Meanings in Cinema, uh, which is I, I've come to realise some sort of key text still. I mean, I think it was first published in the seventies, and it's still like a key text uh, in film studies circles, I, I believe. And that's one of the books at which my pal lent me. Uh, ideas wise, it's it, it's it's it, it's it's been passed. I would imagine by lots of other books because it it was written in the seventies and it's in three sections, kind of Russian, avant-garde, um, auteur cinema, 
and also directors and I can't remember what the third section is um, but theory certainly moved on a lot since then but I think it's it's a brilliant that wall in signs and meanings in cinema is a brilliant foundation for anyone interested in kind of exploring the sort of theoretical side of films I think um, yeah and there's a good series as well I've been getting them kind of when I find them in charity shops and on eBay um, the, the uh, very short books aimed I think at undergrad, undergraduates um, and the series may be called Shortcuts and there's about 50 of them I, do you know this BFI one? It's um, dimly familiar. I don't think the BFI oh, yeah. actually, um, but each film like I've only read two. I, I picked up one in a charity shop in Charlton uh, about new German cinema, and then oh right, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and like the the entire book. It's on like hundred and seven hundred and twenty pages, um, just. It's like a history, a compact history of New German cinema, and each of the 50 books takes a specific aspect of cinema history, such as New German cinema, and it's just like intensely focused on that. But it's very readable, and if you've got nothing to do, you can get through one in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I've been, I've been reading, I've read a couple of them, and I intend to read more. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think we'll we'll be able to kind of genreize things in the future? Because, you know, I was thinking this in terms of music and stuff, and, you know, it's it, it, it's like, well, um, or, or kind of youth cults, you know. Like, can you actually kind of say, like, even with poetry, don't you? You know, it's like, um, I think there's a, I think there's great, um, there's great, there's great renaissance in the novel in the 90s. But I've not seen a book about the nineties novel. No, yeah. I, I, th I think what you might get is something that's been occurring to me throughout sort of discussion about other um, about about other things as well. Is that you might get it kind of centred around particular communities and, and communities of interest mm. because the last. The last two, three years, the cinema I've been watching has been a combination of kind of hard avant-garde, uh, kind of old, uh, creepy TV stuff, particularly from the 70s, particularly English, mm. and an exploitation films. Mm. Can, can, can I just interrupt and butt in, otherwise mm. I'll forget... Um, have you seen a film with BFI of, uh, recently released called Symptoms... No, uh, UK film from the seventies, uh, very much like very reminiscent of the Duke of Burgundy, which came out a couple of years ago. Peter Strickland's that's worth worth a look. Yeah, it's a pop to me as you're speaking. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Um, yeah. And, and within the kind of subset of, of of exploitation films, one of the things is. It, there's kind of two things that are happening, particularly in the States, that I keep coming across in reviews. Um, one is a kind of, not so much exploitation, but a kind of black cinema, which is not, it's not black exploitation. What this is, is kind of essentially everyday romantic comedies, thrillers, yeah, yeah. Um, police procedurals, but specifically with kind of all black cast and aimed specifically at a black audience. And apparently with a lot of these you'll have, particularly said comedies, you'll have kind of gaps for audience reaction. Mm -hmm. And so it's designed for a particular way for the audience to, so the, to this absorb is, this. So new films. So yeah. So it's like, um, it's like taking the Dave Chappelle block party and, yeah. and kind of creating a, 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 a drama around it, really. Yeah. yeah. So, so you'll have, like, say, a cop movie... There might be jokes in it, and there'll be spaces where the audience can react, they can laugh, or they can shout at the at the character for making a stupid decision. Okay. So that's 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 one thing. I'm not very familiar with that. I haven't seen really many of these at all. I've. Are you talking about like mainstream movies? Which oh yeah, yeah. Get, uh, 
Well, they're, they're, they're kind of mainstream. They're, they're less sort of exploitation, but they're, they're aimed specifically at a black audience. Right. Okay. I suppose in the and past we'd have called them straight to video, yeah. where you know, all and, right. Right. And right. Aimed, well, these are theatrical, yeah. and they're aimed at that theatrical audience responding in a particular yeah. way. Um, but I think it's the budget of films, isn't it? Now mm. you can actually, you can actually budget um, a movie mm. f- for a niche audience. Yeah. Um, much much less than a Hollywood movie. Well, the, the, this is this is the other thing I'm getting onto. The you have the other one that I'm really obsessed with at the moment, which is it's just amazing. It blows my mind. Is uh, Christ exploitation? Now, <laughs> what Christ exploitation is? Do you want me to shut the curtains off? Is that is that all right? Sorry, yeah. I'm gonna... wildly flapping my hands about here. <laughs> um, that's a lot better. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. You, you, uh, your Christ exploitation things are your very literalist, uh, fundamentalist Christians. It's this kind of evangelical uh, Protestantism that decides to take bits of the Bible, certainly at, at mm. face value, and is massively homophobic and all the rest of it. Was a summer recently? Um, I don't know if I'm on the right track with this, but. A few weeks ago, I read um, in the Observer, uh, Melissa Joan Hart, Sabrina, the yes. teenage witch. Um, she's appeared in a film recently she, released called. She, she was in a sequel. God is good too, or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's, um, this is one that I've bought for. Uh, well, Clarissa does explain it all. <laughs> <laughs> some, of, some of my, fa- some most of my family this Christmas, I'm buying Christ exploitation films. <laughs> <laughs> God's God's Not Dead was was a film with uh, with Hercules Kevin Sorbo as, as an atheist lecturer. <laughs> he's, he's obviously set up as a, a complete aunt Sally. He's an absolute parody of an atheist. Yeah. Teaching this class, and one kid decides that he's not going to have it. Uh, there's also there's various characters. There's also an, a kind of atheist journalist who's for some reason pestering various Christians. And this ends up with uh, the atheist journalist gets uh, cancer, and so she, so she's going to die. But then I think she accepts God and goes into remission or some bullshit. Kevin Sorbo uh. gets run over because he's an atheist, so fuck him. Uh, <laughs> and, and the most basic thing is he's ly- at the end of this, he's lying on the ground, dead or dying. Oh no, he's died, and, and the two Christians have been trying to get out of town for this whole film. I sort of look at each other and smile, and goes, "Well, what we saw here tonight was a miracle." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think he, I think he did accept God. I think that's by the saying it's a miracle. He accepted okay, God as he okay. was dying. But it's just you're lying. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it, is it, is it Christian film? Yeah, yeah. There's. I think that one might be pure flicks. There's a few. There's a few makers of, of these films. Pure Flix is a big one. Well, the new, the new Ben-Hur remake was aimed at that Christian audience yeah, and has yeah. flopped badly, badly. Oh, yeah, well, they, they tried to remake the... Um, the, uh, the the Rapture movies, uh, whatever they're called. I've, I've got them through there. Um, with uh, Nicolas Cage in the lead. Oh, gosh. Um... The Rapture movies? Yeah. There was The Rapture with Michael Tolkien. No, these Do you are... mean like Joseph and the Technical Adrenco? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, these, these are films about um, the end times, Christian, in, in sort of mental Christian eschatology, you've got the, the end times, the tribulation will come, and the rapture is when these people get taken up to heaven. The, the oh, tribulators okay. get taken up. Uh, Left Behind is a series of movies. Right, right. Um, but is yeah. Is this the new underground cinema? It, it, <laughs> is, it is. It is Christ exploitation cinema. Yeah, but but yeah, going back to uh, God's Not Dead. Kevin Snowbo dies at the end of this. It's a miracle. Wonderful. Fast forward a few years, we now have Melissa Joan Hart as a teacher, who I think wants to teach Christianity, but is prevented by that pesky school board. And so this most of this film is like a, a tedious. Trial, <laughs> where, <laughs> where where people kind of discuss the value of, of teaching 
Christian values in public schools. Well, you know, I have to say, I really enjoyed The Passion of the Christ. I, I, it's, not <laughs> oh, quite, yeah. it's not quite as good as Apocalypse, <coughs> which is a, an immense uh, movie. Mm. But, uh, which it, is the one where he, he has a glove puppet of a beaver. <laughs> uh, that, that might be Jodie no, Foster's yeah. The Beaver. Does so anyone know what I'm talking no, about? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that sounds that sounds like um, another wormhole. I, th- I think I think there's a film called The Beaver where Mel Gibson has a glove puppet of a beaver, and then it, it believes the beaver's taking him over. And I think it might have been directed by Jodie Foster. Was, was this a documentary? No, was no, this, no. I, I, was this someone just following Mel Gibson round while he has a yeah. mental breakdown? Yeah. Let me just look this. Which, which so, thankfully on this occasion isn't anti Semitic. I think it's interesting. We are getting kind of new subgenres. Like last weekend at home, uh, Sarah Perks curated a, a, um, a season of artist films. Um, a lot of artists have worked in video for a, a number of years. Um, but um, not in kind of feature films. And then the stuff of things, so the success of people like Steve McQueen, yeah. um, obviously in somewhat mainstream movies, um, has, has been, well, what about artists doing a feature film um, can actually do an awful lot of... Um, y- because you can do things cheaper than you used to be able to do. So the idea of the artist film has come back. I would say something like Derek Jarman's Blue is yeah. an artist film. Um, um, and um, a really good one was... Um, I can't remember the director, but um, the one after Seabold, um, the um, uh, kind of Grand G, is, is it? it? It's after, a meditation. Yeah, on, I think on, it might have been. It's a meditation Patience after Seabold. Yeah, it's me- 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 meditation on rings of Saturn. Yeah, um, and they're kind of. I suppose they're a new art movie, but they're not trying to be. Um, they might have narrative, um, but they might actually be something else entirely. Yeah, uh, they might be documentary, and the idea is to kind of transition. Um, visual artists who use mm. the film into um, full length features well uh, yeah um, a good example of that I don't know, I mean we saw him at the Whitworth uh, ben earlier Rivers. this year yeah, Ben Rivers his installation um, at, at the Whitworth uh, it was on four screens and it it featured um he, he he was featured footage taken on set of this other director, um, his name might be Lax L A X C, shooting a film called Mimosas, and it sh- featured other footage Ben Rivers had uh, shot himself unconnected to that, and you could just sort of wander um, between the screens. Like, like the Whitworth had a suggested direction, mm. go from that screen to that screen, so on. But, I mean, you, you could go whichever way you want and just sort of piece your own films together. Um, so it worked really terrifically well as an installation, and it was very, very interesting. So sort of po- potentially pointed towards some future directions for cinema. But then a couple of months later, like Ben Rivers. Uh, Released released a film version like a kind of uh, traditional video, one screen yeah, yeah. film version. Yeah, uh, I I think like, artist films are really really interesting. Yeah, um, we saw something else at at the Whitworth. Uh, kind of sixties, uh, typically sixties uh, piece of performance art, <laughs> which which sounds like I'm um, sort of. I, I disapproving of it, but I, I fucking loved it. Um, Carol Schneeman's Meat Feast. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Meat Joy. Meat Feast. I don't remember this. That's a sandwich from Saints Prisma Meat Feast, isn't it? <laughs> uh, meat, joy. meat Joy, yeah. yeah. Um, it was last time, last time we went, there's, there's an exhibition curated by someone, and she's pulled in like a load of different pieces. Um, and Meat Joy oh, yeah. is one of them. Uh, a load of people rolling around and having like sides of meat thrown at him. Um, <laughs> was that on a video? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I missed yeah. that one. So, so I th- there's, there's obviously a tradition of, of artists' films um, s- stretching back uh, yeah. a long, long time. But I think we're having a moment right now. Well, I think also it's it's. I think there'd be an interesting question whether it's it's showing a, a sign of confidence or whether it's showing a maybe a lack of confidence okay. in media art because 
Uh, I've long been interested in media art, of which film is one. But in many ways, media art in the 70s, things like Bruce Nauman and stuff like that, was very much about um, taking this new medium and doing art with it. Yeah? Yeah. And so when you go and see an installation from those from the 1780s, they're having to get, like, VHS recorders yeah. and pneumatic recorders and projectors and all this stuff out, out, out of the cellar to enable them to do, do this art. Um, but and it was as much about the paraphernalia and the installation. Yeah. And now I think with YBAs and stuff, there was quite a moment in terms of uh, video art where it, it kind of got its own confidence. Gillian Waring in particular, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, where she she just had uh, seemed to have an innate understanding of of what this could bring to it. So the classic one that she did was. Um, she had um, it was like a big screen with a photograph of of a, a police force, and the police force were like like it was like a class photograph of this police force. Yeah. yeah. But it was actually a film of them, so they were stood there as if in a still photograph, and obviously they're not still because everyone's. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there was an aspect to that. Um, I want to mention the guy we saw the Barbican uh, right. uh, in a sec. Uh, what was his name? I'd have to look on my phone. Ragnar. Ranya. Um, but, y y yeah, um, I mean, before m mentioning that, that thing you've just talked about in the wearing film, Adrian, mm. uh, I, I, I saw a film called The Man from London uh, by Bella Tarr, uh recently, and it's the first film by this guy that I've ever seen, but it... It it, it, it it blew me away. I mean, it was it was just a black and white two hour film, but it seemed narrative film was a story could fold piece the story together, but he seemed to be pushing like camera movements to the extreme in the sense that there was a lot of that stuff would appear on your screen. It looked like a still life with people, um, and there'd be no movement. So like one of the characters rolled their eyes or something, yeah. you know. It's like how the hell does he have the courage to do this? But it's amazing that he has the courage to do do this. Um, well, one of one of one of the things I um I saw at the festival up in Newcastle a few years ago was the first interactive movie. Right. Um, um, and this movie was by I've just just had to Google it, but it's uh, it's called Kino Kino Automatic. Okay. Kino Automat and. Um, it's directed by uh, Free Checks, who I, I can't even pretend to uh, yeah. say their names. But um, what was really interesting was um, it told a story like one of those Choose Your Own Adventure books. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. um, it appeared at, the, um, uh, at, the, at the, the World Expo in Montreal in '67, And people had um, buttons in their chairs where they could decide which way the story would wow. work. And um, so it was reissued um, a few years ago. I saw it at Tyneside Cinema. And um, beautifully filmed, because, you know, it's, it's on proper film. It's yeah. got that kind of beautiful look of the, of the kind of European new wave, you know. It's, uh, and um, it's a kind of almost like a noir thriller, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, it was a great piece of work, really. But it was, it was really interesting as well, because you suddenly think, oh, actually, there is nothing new under the sun. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, so so yeah. that was kind of an interactive movie with multiple endings and whatever in, in 67 yeah. by a kind of Czech director. As a kind of novelty thing in many ways, but it actually worked cinematically yeah. as well. So I think sometimes when we talk about um, new art forms or new, new versions of film or whatever... Some of these novelty ideas, and that can be included everything from three D glasses to, yeah. to you know, you know, to uh, a different kind of film stocks, etc. Um, are are it, it's always been a medium that's used innovation, hasn't it? Because that kind of brings people yeah. in bums on seats, if you like. Yeah. But I think from an artistic point of view, I think there is kind of um, there is like three parallel histories. There's a the, the there's there's the kind of experimental movie. There's mainstream movies using experimental yeah, techniques yeah. and often pushing them forward, yeah. you know, because they've got the money. And then there's also kind of new media art or video art, if you like. Which, which brings yeah. us back to the, the Barbican guy who... Ragnar Kajartensen. 
Um, we we were in London in in July, uh, and we went along uh, just really for an afternoon, weren't it? Yeah. Um, Go on, you talk about it. Uh, this uh, artist at the Barbican, I've read, um, I've read about him in the Observer, like the weekend before, and he'd had the, he'd done this thing which which seemed pretty cool to me. He'd like recreated one of these kind of um, Monet type paintings um, of like two women in a in a rowing boat um, t- together. And it recreated it with two actual women in an actual rowing boat on an actual river um, in the Barbican, and I thought this this sounds phenomenal. This is, I, this this is a great idea. It's funny um, and, and and it's everything. So we we decided to go and check it out. Now when we got there, it turned out that you could only see this this like money thing brought to life on Sundays and we were there on a Friday or whatever. Yeah. Um but there was a hell of a lot of other good stuff in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what 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 one of the I mean the two main pieces there were two main pieces on the ground floor. Um one was you you went in and was about ten Musicians like sprawled around the place on big cushions and chairs and couches and on mattresses, like strumming um, guitars and whatnot. And they were doing it in front of this big screen, which was like I think it was a soft palm film from the 70s, which had the artist's parents in it Ragnar <laughs> K- K- Kjartsson, um or whatever his name is. and uh, the musicians were like strumming this song. Um, uh, the musicians were strumming um, and singing the lyrics, singing the words to the porn film. <laughs> right, so you'd stand there, and <laughs> the lyric that you kept on hearing was, and I think the piece might be called this. Uh, Take me now by the dishwasher <laughs> or something. <laughs> um, and, you could just you could just wander around, and these guys like they had they had small piles of empty cans of beer next to the the cushion or wherever they were sitting, just to kind of represent well how much beer they drunk, but also represent <laughs> how long they'd been sat there. Um, and it was kind of like a beef at the, uh, at the Tower of London situation. We never tested it, but I thought you could like potentially go up to them and like do this, and, and they just not acknowledge you <laughs> that you were there or something. Yeah. It, it it was very it was very good, funny, and clever, but it also sort of eerie. Uh, would you agree? Yeah. Um, in the sense, like you were intruding. There was, there was an element that, of that, that you felt like you were intruding. In someone's house, just like wandering through someone's room yeah. or something. Did you ever go and see? Um, I think it was Naked Men Reading at the. Um, um, uh, uh, what was it called? The. Um, uh, there was a, there was a temporary exhibition space uh, just beyond, just down from home. Uh, no, uh, as part of blank space, yeah, blank space oh, yeah. reading. Right. And they had this one exhibition which was Naked Men Reading, <laughs> which was. <laughs> Make him memory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. I think I think it's interesting um, that the idea of performance seems to be um, something that we, you know, we it's gone mainstream, hasn't it? You know, Abramovich is the obvious one. You yeah. know, in a sense, and the things she did where people came in and had a ch- sat yeah. opposite her for an hour each day. Or very similar, like um, Anthony Gormley's one and other on the on the fourth plinth, which I was talking to someone about the other day. This idea of experiential performance art, I'm 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 sort of mixed mixed view of it really in, in some ways because I can't quite decide whether I, I I'm a great believer in everyone can be an artist. Yeah, yeah. But everyone being an artist doesn't mean people end up having to be. Um, a poor artist. I think everyone can be a really good artist. You know, they just have to find their medium and, and something that works for them. Mm-hmm. And I, I sometimes think there's something a little reductionist in us being, um, you know, bit part players in someone else's work. 
but whether it's a Spencer Tunic installation or or, or, or whatever, people like that performance element of it because I think there's almost this idea that um, of cultural value now is is something about um, oh it must be popular and mm. popular means you know bums on seats literally in the case of Spencer Tunic, <laughs> <laughs> um, but and I I I I I struggle with that a little bit. Um, I'm I'm haven't gone round galleries for years and sometimes been the only person who's mm. turned up for the day. Well, but yeah, I mean, I mean, with Spencer Tunic, I think for me, the reason I don't like him very much is that it plays into this idea of a kind of, sp on the one hand, spectacle and on the other hand, accomplishment. Yeah. And with him, it's kind of spectacle. It's like a lot of people, a mass of bodies. But but it, it, you know that that kind of school of things. It's also like that thing that you occasionally see on, on Facebook, where somebody does a, kind of airbrush picture of a bottle that looks exactly like the real bottle. It's tremendous. You know, it's, oh, yeah. it, it's either something that's tremendously impressive as an actual technical skill. Sand, sand dogs. Yeah. Sand dogs outside supermarkets. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. But why? But yeah. There's, yeah. there's absolutely no <laughs> content to it. It's it's either spectacular. Or it shows a great deal of skill, but there's just nothing, nothing in it. Yeah, no, I, the, the, yeah, there's, I, I, yeah, I think that you know, in a sense, that's probably the heart of the contemporary conundrum about mm. about art. Really, is is that um, we, we've almost switched it round because the criticism of modern art was, oh, anyone could do that. Clearly, where there's a lot of craft involved, anyone can't do it, mm. but enough people can do it. Um, I read a really interesting. I was on a flight once. And I read this article about the um, uh, what do you call them? The, uh, uh, the the kind of living statues. Yeah. And I think oh, yeah. I think there's one city in France, Nantes or somewhere, where it became a really competitive thing. So that because <laughs> the, the living statues were there, kind of with like a, a costume and just one pose. Yeah. But increasingly, it became very competitive. So people started. Putting, you know, kind of doing things that look impossible and having lots of paraphernalia and whatever. Yeah. And I used so to want to be a living statue. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I thought it was very good. Please explain why and, 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 and did you pursue it at all? I didn't pursue it because I thought I couldn't stand still long enough. <laughs> but, but you can learn that, I believe. I, can, I believe you can learn it. There probably are classes you can Although go to. Although most of the ones that I see on Market Street were like, don't stand still at all. <laughs> I like the ones <coughs> where they sat on a stick. You yeah, explain that to yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's what I mean. They're, they're, up, they're up in the ante now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not just enough well, to... Once you've seen it once, you've seen it a thousand times, though, haven't you? Oh, it never gets tired for And the sand dogs, <laughs> there's loads of people making them. Yeah. Loads of people making do reckon, them everywhere. Why do, don't they make a crocodile as do, well? Do you, reckon, do, you, do, you reckon that, do you reckon there's a class? Do you reckon there's like a... Sand dog a, class? Yeah, you know, like a, there's, a, there's an MVQ in sand dogs. MVQ 2, I think. <laughs> Uh, these things you don't know, but some, I think that's really interesting that these things you don't know about, and suddenly they're everywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah, like selfie yeah. sticks or hummus or... or yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or red trainers, which um, yeah. I, I, I'm not wearing them today, <clears throat> but I recently bought a pair of red trainers, and now I feel like I can't walk down the street without seeing 50 people you in look red at, trainers. You're attuned to red trainers. Oh, you weren't one of the people queuing up in the Northern Court for the Manchester trainers, were you? Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> I, I got these after uh, spending about 10 hours feeling anxious in size on Mark History. <laughs> <laughs> you can have these, or you can have these. Which do you want? Eventually, I said, I'll have them just so I could go and watch the telly or something. <laughs> oh, <Get shocked>. <laughs> I'll go fop when I feel safe. <laughs> I'm with me on kind in fop. <laughs> Middle-aged men who just like to buy DVDs and pile them up. <laughs> Never watch them. Uh, thanks again for listening to Santiago's Dead Wasp cast. It's been uh, me, Matt Dolby, uh, Adrian Slatcher, Richard Barrett and our anonymous guest. In two weeks, Wasp cast will be back. Immediately next week, it'll be uh, Santiago's Dead Media. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>